Do you want to become a better philosopher? It's often a challenging question to address and grow from, partly because learning philosophy is so complicated, especially today, where you are torn between a number of different ways to learn philosophy. You could learn it by someone else teaching it to you, like who's not writing the work, whether that be a commentary written by someone else about someone else, whether that be a professor, whether that be YouTube, which is a really interesting avenue, or whether that be primary literature. Um, I think primary literature is the only way to penetrate into the philosophy that I guess you could call real philosophy. I'm, I don't mean that to employ a no true Scotsman kind of thing. I think philosophy is very varied and even though I prefer continental philosophy, um, you know, the continental and analytic philosophy go hand in hand and they blur the lines all the time. So philosophy is a lot of different forms, but a lot of philosophy is very intimate and it requires being intimate with the literature and parsing things out for yourself because Part of these ideas is very much like learning a new language where the word order is different or where the grammar is very different. Um, for me, it's kind of like learning Russian where there's no articles, no thes or a's. Um, just, you know, it's a, it's a different way of structuring a language and that can be very difficult for some people. And I think in the same way, a lot of difficult philosophy is difficult precisely because you really have to frame it in your own mind and learn it the way you want to. And I think that's best if you don't have someone interpolating it for you and trying to make it something in a sense that it's not because philosophy is very personal and your understanding of it is very nuanced and I think is best gained from primary literature. So all that to say, I have eight works here for you that I think should be considered if you want to become a better philosopher. Some of these you may have read, some of them you may have not, and uh, I've kind of got an interesting and kind of eclectic list of stuff that would work for everyone because I think a lot of these lists try to be too broad and, you know, I could put, I could put Plato's Republic on here, I could put Pascal's Pensées, um, I could put a number of other works in here that would work for some people, but didn't really give me that revolutionary, um, philosophical boost that these did. So these might not be works you've heard of or that you've considered as being something worth reading, but I'm going to give you kind of an overview of each of them, uh, not a philosophical overview, but just kind of a, a like something you'd see on the back of the book, you're buying it, um, and maybe some tips for reading them because some of them are very challenging and some of them are just fun. And in terms of fun, the first is this pre-Socratics reader. This is a, I think it's a Hackett book, let's see. Yeah, this is a Hackett book. This is kind of, you know, you see a lot of Hackett um, philosophical classics or whatever. This is a really great volume, uh, Pre-Socratics Reader, Selected Fragments and Testimonia. Uh, I'll kind of put names and stuff in the description and whatnot and flesh this out a little bit because I'm sure, you know, it's hard to see the cover super clearly. But this is really great because it has some of the magic that I think a lot of ancient philosophy lacks. Um, as someone who is very interested in Heraclitus and Hegel and Heidegger by extension, because I think they very much are talking about the same things. This is really nice because not only does it give you insight into some really cool philosophy, but it gives you enough historical grounding um, about each of these philosophers that it gives you something to base what other philosophers are talking about in the future off of. Um, it, mentions a couple different philosophers in here. Um, it talks about the Milesian philosophers of Thales, Anaximeter, and 
Anaximenes, um, you know, talks about Xenophon, Heraclitus, Parmenides, Zeno, um, Protagoras, Gorgias, Critias. So those are those last ones are in Plato. Um, so it gives you the philosophies of atomism and you know Heraclitus's philosophy of flux and um, just all this weird stuff. It's all fragments mostly. Um, Par Parmenides has some larger stuff, but so much of this has been lost to the annals of history and we just have little fragments, but it's a really great little book. I finished it in maybe a day or two. It's like a hundred pages, um, but it's really nice, really handy, really opened up my philosophical horizons. And I, I read that after I read The Phenomenology of Spirit. Um, so I think there's not necessarily a, an order you should read these books in. Maybe I might do that sometimes, but I mean, whenever you want to do that. Um, any philosopher would be incomplete without reading Descartes' Meditations. This is once again one of those Hackett volumes. And Descartes' Meditations are so interesting because whatever your religious affiliation is, whatever your kind of metaphysical philosophies are or whatever ontology you adhere to in epistemology, you can find something out of Descartes' meditations, mostly because it's extremely personal and it's a very large project that a lot of philosophers are still experimenting with and learning about. And his writing is very fluid and beautiful and really gives you something to chew on. Um, if you're an atheist, there's lot, like me, there's a lot of, um, you know, the whole thing is, uh, you know, meditations on first philosophy in which the existence of God and the distinction of the soul from the body are demonstrated. So it's meant to um, get you to agree with both theism and mind-body dualism. So a great introduction to both of those. Um, just an epistemic kind of building block of modern philosophy that anyone should consider. Then another philosophy that's one of my favorites is Nietzsche. And Nietzsche is so interesting because his writing is just beautiful. Um, I, someone on Brian McGee's show said that, um, you know, Nietzsche's probably second only to Plato in terms of the artistic brilliance of his philosophy. I think Nietzsche's better than Plato, in my opinion, in terms of artistic brilliance, but I've got so many flags on this little book. Um, this is Nietzsche's human all too human. And in terms of recommending Nietzsche, I could recommend The Gay Science or Thus Spoke Zarathustra um, or Edge Homo or however you say it, I don't speak Latin. Um, but Human All Too Human is really nice. Um, this one, I just love like the format of this. This is a Bison at University of Nebraska Press um, copy of this and it's really nice. It's 200 something pages. Yeah, just shy of 270 pages. Um, and Nietzsche is both approachable and not approachable. He is approachable because he writes a lot in aphorisms. So short, you know, anywhere from a few lines to two or three or four pages um, of small ideas that are connected in chapters. And in this case, there's a few different chapters. Let's see exactly what they are. Um, of first and last things on the history of moral feelings, religious life, uh, from the soul of artists and writers, signs of higher and lower culture, man and society, woman and child. So um, this is very interesting because it very much, you see psychology and philosophy coming together in a sense. It's talking about human nature and about how we function. And, you know, Nietzsche is struggling or not really struggling, but having to redefine philosophy in light of Darwin which creates a really interesting kind of, this is a very naturalistic philosophy. Um, it's very much like blunt analytic truths, but has the brilliance of 
ancient and kind of like those really cool content of philosophers that everyone really likes. And this work is so personal in terms of Nietzsche. I think it's a lot more approachable. Um, it explains a lot of his concepts, you know, kind of gets, gets a little bit into the will to power, um, but talks a lot about Nietzsche's stance on morality, which I think is central to anyone who wants to understand anything about ethics. So I think Human All Too Human is a fantastic book for anyone to read. Now, any list would be incomplete without Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. You can see all of the different flags and stuff I've got in here. Um, I have marked the bejesus out of this book and um, this is the book that transformed, transformed me the most philosophically. Um, it is just a massive project. Um, you need the Miller translation, I think, for your first reading, simply because um, that's the standard translation people have used so much for so long. Um, there's also that other one by, I can't remember, uh, Giovanni, I think is his name. He's Italian or French Canadian or something. I don't know. Um, I think he teaches in Canada, but this book will change your life. Um, it, and I've seen so many people say this and I can't agree more. Hegel's phenomenology of spirit requires you to change the way you think in a very fundamental way. Um, you start thinking about the grammar of existence uh, to kind of put it very eclectically. Um, Hegel is very ahead of his time, but I think especially if you read that pre-Socratics reader, especially the stuff um, Parmenides and Heraclitus have to say, this will become a lot easier to read. Um, learning philosophy requires you to consult lots of different sources, and we have been graced in this modern period with YouTube and online resources um, if you're reading Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, you need Dr. Gregory B. Sadler's um, series on the Phenomenology of Spirit. Each paragraph in the Miller translation is numbered. This is paragraph 402 and 403. He has a 30 minute video, it's his half hour Hegel series. Um, and each paragraph has a 30 minute lecture dedicated to it. It will help you. Um, that being said, um, there is also a commentary at the, at the end of the text that's roughly, I don't know how many, 100, 150 pages. Um, I didn't find myself consulting it that much, and this is where you have to find what's right for you. For me, I stumbled through the first five pages for several weeks, kept putting the book down, kept being like, what the fuck is this? This is just crazy and it doesn't make any sense. And it sounds like he's speaking a different language. Partly because if you speak English, he does speak a different language, but even translated into English, this is one of those texts that's so hard to translate. Um, not only do you have to have the right translation, but you have to reorient your mind. And it really is like being immersed in a new language. Um, the way he uses italics and capital letters and punctuation and all this is extremely important and you have to get rid of some of the typical conventions of how English works if you're reading it in English if you're reading it in German even better um, I have a German copy um, you really need to just reorient the way you think um, and if you're at all interested in languages or interesting interested in understanding the phenomenology in a deeper way, get a German copy. Words like Aufhebung and Wissenschaft and Geist and these words don't have perfect English equivalents. Take Wissenschaft, for example, which is typically translated as science, um, such as the case in the Wissenschaft der Logik, the science of logic, which is kind of Hegel's second best known work. Um, Wissenschaft does not exclusively mean the natural sciences like chemistry or biology. It just is a systematic pursuit of knowledge. So that can be 
cultural criticism, that can be political theory, that can be political science, that can be sociology, that can be, you know, some of the soft sciences would technically be a vision shop too. Um, and the phenomenology of spirit would be a vision shop. Um, so get a German copy of the phenomenology. Um, it might be an expensive endeavor. You don't need it. You don't need it. I only had to consult it a couple times, um, but it can be helpful and it gives you new insight. Um, and I'm minoring in German in college, so it just kind of lines up right for me. Um, but for Hegel's phenomenology, read it slowly. Don't skim. If you're a, if you're a mindless reader, this book is either not for you or you need to change what you are because um, Hegel does not bend a knee to anyone. Some people say that Hegel is meant to be, like that he wanted his writing to be so confusing and perplexing um, and that he was almost kind of, uh, I don't know, punishing his readers. I don't think that's the case. I think he's very precise with his language and very beautiful at times. He has a lot of the same German beauty that Nietzsche displays, um, but his language is a lot more technical and um, it helps to understand Kant a little. Um, I read the phenomenology without having read any of Kant's works in their completion, but you can get a lot of supplemental knowledge from YouTube and from online resources, um, but just find out what works for you. And I've read this book several times and I still don't know everything what's going with what's going on. Um, for me, the first half of the book is kind of uh, confusing, you know, with the like force and stuff like this. Um, but then towards the end, when he starts talking about morality and culture and religion, and that's kind of where the dialectic and all that comes together. Um, if you want kind of a good goal, um, the preface, the preface is 45 pages and it basically says what the whole work says in essence in 45 pages. That being said, you don't get a lot of the insight. So reading the whole book, I promise you, if you think you understand Hegel completely by the time you finish the preface, you are wrong. Because I thought it was that way until I got through the book and I realized just how much um, was unknown that I would have lost if I hadn't read the preface. So try to get a German copy. Um, it's gonna change the way you think and it's amazing and it's the greatest um, philosophical work I've ever read. Now, this is, a, this is a bit of an interesting one. Um, Arthur Schopenhauer's Studies in Pessimism. I got this recommended um, from a Cosmic Skeptic video. Um, and this is a Swan, Sonner, Shine and Co. London uh, printing of it doesn't really matter. I, I think this particular volume is really nice. Um, firstly, because it's designed really nice, like the cover is like, glossy and nice, um, but the pages are big. And this book is really fascinating because if you've ever seen a pessimist, it's Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer is so blunt and cutting. I heard Michael Sugru talking about Nietzsche, talking about he's the thrower of little darts. I think Schopenhauer is the thrower of little darts, which is kind of funny because Schopenhauer and Nietzsche just kind of had a rivalry. Nietzsche hated Schopenhauer. Um, but this speaks a lot to me personally. Um, there's a lot, you know, there's a couple different essays in here. Um, you've got um, On the Sufferings of the World, which I think is really interesting because it talks about the role suffering plays in our lives and what should we make of that. Um, on the Vanity of Existence, On Suicide. On Suicide wrecked me personally. Um, it is a very dangerous book in a sense, but I think the pursuit of knowledge should be pursued head on. and. 
quite frankly, Schopenhauer makes a compelling argument for the fact that you should kill yourself. Let me reiterate, I do not think you should kill yourself. And partly that is because I've read through this book and come to grips with what he said. And it transformed the way I live personally. Um, usually I don't like the idea of philosophy as like a self-help book. I hate like the modern pop philosophy kind of, it's not really deep or philosophical. It's just a, you know, how to live the good life. I hate stoicism too, for the same reason. Um, this is the self-help book that you open it up and it shoots fire in your face and puts hot coals under your feet. It's like the kind of self-help book that really does make you change your life, not in some itsy bitsy little um, self-help kind of way, but really lighting a fire under your feet and just read it with an open mind and <laughs> read it slowly and it's like, it's okay to put it down. It is, it is depressing. It's very depressing. Um, it put me in a depressive mood for weeks um, after reading it, but it's incredible and a very worthwhile endeavor. This is one book. I know I have two in my hand, but it's, it's one book. Um, Heidegger's Being in Time. You cannot call yourself a serious modern philosopher if you haven't read Being in Time. And that's not me saying that I am a serious modern philosopher, um, but you kind of understand what I mean when you read it. Um, first off, you need the Macquarie and Robinson translation. Uh, this is the most readily available one, the Harper Perennial Classics or Perennial Modern Thought edition. Um, it is a monster text that, I mean, I just, I sp spend all my time just marking the shit out of it. It's, it's a book you'll never get finished with. I was talking with one of my professors about being in time when I told him that I had read it and he was like, oh, oh yeah, I read being in time all the time. He was, he was like, yeah, I decided to start on page one five years ago and I'm still on page one. And I was like, ha ha ha, that's very funny. But he makes a good point. Um, Heidegger is very similar to Hegel in a sense but very different. Um, the project is somewhat similar and he is wrestling with Descartes and uh, certain Hegelian ideas um, and also a lot of like scholastic thinkers. So, because um, his family was kind of Christian adjacent or Christian involved. Um, being in time is really difficult um, because he, Hegel doesn't invent new words. Um, Heidegger invents new words or maybe not new words, but so new is the way they're being used. It's practically, it, it's just mind boggling. I mean, if you've never heard the word Dasein before, you will by the time you've finished being in time. Um, being in time is an unfinished work that Heidegger never completed. It's still completely restructured the entirety of modern philosophy. Um, just try your best in a similar way. Um, it is imperative, imperative that you have Sign and Sight, the German copy. I just found the PDF online and I sent it off to a printing company near me to get spiral bound. Um, it has been indispensable in my study of being in time, partly because it is such a difficult work to translate. Um, I mean, just, it's such a difficult word, uh, work to translate. And because of that, you must read every footnote don't skip the footnotes. It's a bad idea, especially in the first like 10 to 20 pages. Um, you know, every time there's a new word that comes up, there's a sizable footnote and then there's kind of smaller like reference footnotes and stuff like that. So, you know, maybe not like every single footnote, but look at each of the footnotes at least. And sometimes you have to really think about and highlight those footnotes a lot. 
but um, like especially like the footnote on Dasein, like that is crucial to read. And if you don't read it, you won't understand what he's saying. Um, maybe that's a little bit too categorical, but at least for my case, um, I found it crucial to read all the footnotes. Um, there's like an index in the back of the book, which is pretty nice. Um, also, try to keep a look out for key concepts. It's a very easy work to get lost in. It's arranged. I, I like the way it's arranged in terms of the way it's set up together in the text. It's in, you know, chapters that are sizable, but not too big that you can't chew on them. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting concepts he talks about. Um, but keep a lookout for key ideas. You can see I've got some flags in here at several spots where he's kind of got said stuff that's really important. Heidegger is kind of quotable, but really um, he requires a larger understanding than just quoting him at random. Um, I think in particular, um, chapter four, being in the world as being with and being oneself, the they, um, that word the they is das man, which is probably one of his more interesting concepts because it highlights the importance of human being as being enmeshed in a world, um, you know, being in the world, um, in der Weltsein is such a crucial concept and Wittgenstein does some similar stuff with that. Um, and I know I'm kind of going to a little bit of a technical direction, but, um, like, especially like chapter four, um, section 27, um, is really good. That's where he first talks about Das Man. Um, and then in chapter five, in being in as such, uh, section 29, 34, 36, 37, 38, I've just got a couple sections that I saw as being particularly interesting, um, talking about language, about ambiguity, about thrownness. Thrownness is um, such an important concept um, in Heidegger. Uh, there's a commentary on Heidegger that I read a while ago um, that I was recommended when listening to a lecture um, by Hubert Dreyfus. Um, Hubert Dreyfus's lectures online, I'll leave a link in the description. They are massive and substantive, but crucial to understanding Heidegger. Um, Heidegger is so uh, kind of ambiguous that you can read him in so many different ways. So you might get kind of a biased understanding of Heidegger when you hear Dreyfus talking about him, but I think he's not too uh, dogmatic in the way that he teaches it. Um, and he's just like the master. So who am I to like, you know, get onto him for that. Um, but, I will leave the link to that commentary too. It's like a reader's guide. Um, and that one is pretty nice too. Um, I think just Dreyfus gave the best advice. Just read the book over and over and over. Um, you just have to read those sections over and over. I've got some videos on my channel talking about tool being and Dasein and um, some other like key terms and stuff like that that I kind of haven't really done a lot with that series recently, but that might be a nice place to start if you're kind of considering the book. Um, but just consult a lot of online resources and do what you can. It's, it's kind of a, it's a really challenging work, but I think you should read The Phenomenology of Spirit before you read Being in Time, um, just because it's a similar project and you get a similar reorienting idea in your mind that's going to help you um, actually be able to comprehend what he's trying to do. Um, I think this is one of the more approachable books that I have on here. Salta's Existentialism is a Humanism. Um, this Yale University Press little copy is really nice, also because it's really well made. Um, it's just over 100 pages. Yeah, it's just over 100 pages. Um, but he has two works in here. You've got Existentialism as a Humanism and then A Commentary on the Stranger. This is a really great work because it serves as both a good kind of 
discussion on ethics um, and also existentialism. Um, you can kind of figure out from the title kind of what is going on. Um, he's basically trying to give an account of ethics within an existentialist framework. Um, I think he fails. I think most people think he fails, um, but it's in a dialogue kind of manner. So he, he, he talks for a while and then in the end there's a small little Q&A session that goes on with him um, and some other guy who's, it doesn't even say, oh wait, uh, Pierre Neville, maybe. Or maybe he was quoting him, I don't know. I think that was the guy that was asking the questions, but um, that's really nice, just really approachable and um, I finished it in a day. It was super, super easy and I'm a really slow reader. Um, and then a commentary on The Stranger is really nice. The Stranger by Albert Camus, uh, another existentialist text, kind of gives you some understanding for what the existentialists themselves saw the field as um, in the pursuit. And I think it gives important insight that helps you understand how to look at existentialism. I think it's a fairly compelling form of philosophy and it's very personable and um, deep and it has some of that similar dread that you might get from someone like Schopenhauer, um, but it's also very much a philosophy of freedom. So this is a really great text if you're like not super, super into philosophy and you don't want to read Being in Time or Phenomenology where you're going to have to have, you know, multiple translations and their original language and all these online resources. You don't need hardly any, uh, you never have to consult an outside resource really for this. You just might have to have a little bit of background, maybe with like Descartes or something like, just something to kind of get you in the door with philosophy. Um, and then this last book, um, Object-Oriented Ontology by Graham Harmon. This is a really weird work. Um, it's like 250 pages, I think. Yeah, 260 pages. And it's really nice because even though it's fairly modern, it was published, by the way, this is the Pelican um, printing of it but it was published in 2018, I think. And despite that, it's not super modern. It's got like a modern take on ontology. And I think it's kind of, I don't really think it works. Um, same thing with like Timothy Morton. I think they're kind of out there, um, but I haven't really done, I want to get back into them in a little bit and kind of reassess, but Object-oriented ontology is really nice because it's a very small, very approachable work to talk about what ontology is, kind of if there's a difference between it and metaphysics, um, subjectivity versus objectivity, what does it mean for something to exist, what is real versus not real, do not real things exist or do they not exist, what does that even mean, um, like fictional characters and metaphors, are they real, do they exist? Um, do they not? Stuff like that. Um, it's got this really nice, this diagram of knowledge that he uses a few times um, is really nice. And he has an earlier version of it. I'm gonna look for it real quick, I think. Yeah, between um, real and sensual objects and real qualities and sensual qualities. Um, it's been a long time since, it's been like a year since I've read this work, um, but I found that to be really helpful in understanding ontology and really getting a grip on what it was trying to say. So I think if you're worried about like being in time or the phenomenology of spirit, give this book a read. It won't take you very long and he uses a lot of good examples in here to make his point clearly, even if he's incorrect, at least he makes his point clearly. Um, and he treats you like you have no idea what ontology is, which when I read this book, I didn't. So, um, you know, it's a just a great segue into the world of ontology, which I think is the most fascinating, um, maybe second to like epistemology, but um, a really great, really small work, accessible language, not super complicated. Um, he mentions some um, 
like Bruno Latour and like some people like that that are a little bit more obscure kind of modern continental people um, but you don't have to have read really any of the people that he mentions he's not like uh, like Zizek or someone like that who loves to um, just mention in passing other philosophers and assume that you know already what they're talking about um, Harmon is very accessible and very it's very pop philosophy, but it's still good. Um, so those are the eight works. I hope that gives you something to chew on and something to um, interest your pursuits. And I hope that you learn something new by approaching these works or at least considering them.